Crisis Control, brought to you by Zerilio. Cybersecurity experts protecting Australian businesses and organisations so we can all be safer together. Sherlock and welcome to Crisis Control. Today we peel back the layers of secrecy and intrigue surrounding AI to reveal how businesses can leverage the power of artificial intelligence while reducing the risks. But first, let's set the scene. From Siri to self-driving cars, email spam filters and Netflix recommendations, artificial intelligence touches our lives on a daily basis. But AI is more profound than that. It enables computers to crunch massive amounts of data and to use learned intelligence to make decisions in a fraction of the time it would take humans. AI is projected to have a lasting impact on just about every industry imaginable and is being used in everything from medical breakthroughs to climate change research. Companies of all stripes are working on ways to integrate AI into their businesses to improve customer experience, to drive productivity and eliminate waste. In the case of CBA, which has taken a minority stake in a global AI leader, H20.AI, artificial intelligence is being used to better detect fraud and scams, as well as make credit decisions. How do we better predict natural disasters as they occur? We've seen bushfires across the globe over the last 24 months. We want to be able to better understand when they're likely to happen, the paths that they take, how we support our customers understand what's going to happen when and what support we have available to them based on their situation. There is also a battle over AI in the cloud, with the three big hyperscalers, Amazon, Google and Microsoft, vying for dominance. So one of the future use cases we see happening that's very exciting to watch play out is you know, who will own AI in the cloud and the idea of being able to run these machine learning experiments um, using where you essentially borrow some compute time from a massive um, public cloud um, to be able to run very complex uh, AI experiments, machine learning experiments. However, if the ultimate goal of AI is for machines to simulate human intelligence, in doing so, will they become human? Does it even matter? On today's program, I'm joined by Christina Larkin, EY Assurance Digital Trust Lead, James Wilson, CEO at ELISA, and Liming Zhu, CSIRO's Data61 Research Director. Welcome to the program. James, let's start with you. How much is AI being used today in Australia and how much are you thinking it will form part of the future? Yeah, thanks, Amber. And, um, you know, we're seeing kind of pretty significant uptick in adoption across um, large large enterprise um, government sectors in Australia. I think a few years ago, it was mostly kind of small scale experimentation. And over the last three years, we've really seen that dial up now as uh, large enterprises are using AI as part of their, their core business processes. So what do you see as the exciting things that AI can do for us in the short term? I and mean, how do you see it being used in the next five years? Yeah, you know, we kind of see three key areas where people are using AI today. And the, the first one is kind of automating manual processes or business processes. So things like um, loan or loan origination, credit decisioning, claims automation, and taking away a lot of that manual effort that's typically involved with those kind of processes. Uh, we're also seeing it used to provide much more personalized experiences for customers. Think about recommending you the right product to buy or uh, being able to deliver a much more personalized experience for a customer. Now, one of the major issues surrounding AI at the moment is the ethics behind it. So how much are consumers concerned with, with that side of it that you're seeing? I think this is increasingly becoming a really hot topic at board level. Um, and we, you, know, you hear the, the term responsible AI. Um, and often what AI really means is it's a, a way of automating some form of decision. And if that decision is recommending you a book to read or uh, a song to listen to, there's very little that can go wrong with that. But if you're using it to make a decision that has a real impact on someone's life, whether it's which whether they're going to get into university or whether they're going to be eligible for parole, then these are very, very different decisions. And I think this is where some of the concern comes in. Liming, you lead the software and computer systems program at CSIRO's Data61. What are some of the things that you guys are researching? Yeah, actually, um, you know, AI can perform a lot of different tasks these days very efficiently. So from natural language processing to vision to 
uh, robotics, we, we are doing research in all these areas to help Australian industry to stay ahead, to, to add to their competitive advantage. Uh, but one interesting uh, area we, we touch on right now and putting a lot of effort behind is the response to AI. As AI is trying to solve problem autonomously, obviously there's a lot of unplanned, uh, unintended consequences. And, and you read this on the news, and, and James mentioned uh, some examples already. And how do you assure that, that your AI will do it safely in an ethical way? Australia already uh, is ahead. They launched the Australian's AI ethics framework co-developed by Data Sichuan. But how do we operationalize it? How do we get the board to understand it? It is type of research we're working on right now. So that's the main so focus of Australian businesses right now in terms of AI? Yeah, so we, we see that uh, it's not just, uh, you know, everybody worried about the risks. Uh, they see it both as a risk and as an opportunity. If you really can mitigate the risk, you gain uh, advantage and you gain consumer trust. Trust is really the new currency in this economy, in the world of AI. So doing AI, ethical AI, is not about just the compliance and avoiding risks, but to leverage that as a competitive advantage and opportunity. Okay, Christine, let's okay, bring you in. Uh, just how much of a role do you think AI is going to have in organisations in the future? We hear so much about it, we're promised the world. Uh, realistically, how much of a part will it be? Uh, I think it's going to be huge. Um, I think AI is going to play a role in every single sector and we're only really just scratching the surface today. Uh, we're seeing organisations like the mining sector, you know, we've got one of the largest autonomous systems in the world based up in the Pilbara region. Um, with with the, a huge train, you know, we've got some huge opportunities here in Australia, but we're really only just touching the surface and the opportunity for Australian organisations is really to explore those opportunities and start experimenting with the technology, albeit in, in a very safe way um, with the trust frameworks that Leming talked about. From what you're seeing, how enthusiastic are businesses to embrace AI as a better way to work? I mean, it, it all sounds very exciting, but a business is actually excited and doing something about it. I think businesses are really excited. Um, I think there is a bit of trepidation with that trust element because, you know, on one hand, people want to get the benefits and, and gain the benefits that AI promises to deliver. But at the same time, they don't want to compromise the trust that they have with their customers and their stakeholders. So I think it's that fine balance that customers and, and organizations are really trying to find with AI. I'll put this out to, to all of you. I guess if businesses get it right, what do they stand to gain for pursuing AI within their organisation? Does anyone want to answer that for me? Well, I'll think, throw it to you. <laughs> I, I, I think there's huge benefits. Yeah. I mean, the one that everyone jumps to is the efficiency gains yeah. as, as the first um, real benefit, but there's huge other gains. You know, we talked about customer acquisition and retention. Uh, the quality gains um, are really important. The safety gains are another one that, that a lot of organisations look to pursue. So I think it's really important to keep an open mind and think about the benefits in quite a, a wide sense rather than a narrow efficiency sense. Uh, Liming, are we investing enough into AI in Australia as a country? Uh, I think that that's probably, if you look at other countries in terms of the billions of dollars that they have put in, uh, at absolute term, we seem to be not investing a lot. But on the other hand, I mean, the Australian is, is the economy is not that large. Comparatively, we are investing significantly in it, especially from the business side. And with the new National AI Center, Australian government just launched with hosted by Saro City Sichuan, it is really helping this leverage uh, of private business investment into AI. And we see that happening a lot. And uh, in terms of the competitive advantage they gain, Obviously, not just in efficiency, I agree with uh, the other panelists, but also importantly, it's getting into new markets. As you know, the industry. Uh, what countries are, are really leading the way? Uh, the what, sorry, I was, what countries are leading the way when it comes to IAI, and what sorts of things are they doing as opposed to what we're doing here in Australia? Well, in, in terms of research, Australia actually is quite leading the way among the top. Uh, countries in the world doing excellent AI research. But in terms of industry adoption, translation, obviously US, EU have their strengths because of the sheer size of their market, the ability to take up, pick up AI solutions. So the type of thing we can do better in Australia is to help Australian companies to take AI as a competitive advantage in international markets. 
export it, not just looking at the domestic market. I, I think Australia has a significant advantage in this space is the trust uh, other countries have on you know, Australia's uh, mature regulation system, uh, the economy, the stable economy, the, the, the business environment and the, the trusted brand. James, look, everyone's been talking about this recently. An AI engineer obviously stood down for claiming an AI bot he was working on was sentient. We've all talked it about the dinner table. It's been a hot topic. Uh, what do you think? Is there a legitimate concern there? Um, I don't think there's a legitimate, legitimate concern just, just yet. I think um, if you were to survey uh, the brightest minds in AI around the world and ask them how far away we are from reaching that, that magical point of singularity where machines are at the same level as, as humans. I think uh, the general consensus would be that it's, uh, it's still a very long way off at best. So I don't think there's any major concern that we should be worried about the Terminator just yet. Well, Christina, what do you think? Uh, I, I'm pretty much in agreement with that comment, James. I mean, I don't think that that's a legitimate concern. I think we've got bigger concerns when it comes to AI. Um, some of the ethical risks around bias, privacy and, and accuracy are, are things that kind of at, at the top of my mind um, rather than sentience. So um, I, I'm in agreement. Li Ming, should we be worried about AI taking over? And if not, when do we need to worry? Yeah, I think we need to worry right now, but not for AI being sentient or, or taking over, but about the ethical risks we were just talking about. Uh, on the other hand, I, I think that example you just given actually demonstrated that human can be manipulated by AI. I mean, they, they are not manipulating you consciously, but interacting with an AI-driven system can give you a sense of, you know, around emotion, appear sentiment, sent, uh, sentinel, and all this consciousness thing. If we are not managing that risks, human can be easily manipulated by AI system. Even this AI system are, dumb, are not uh, intelligent or, or sentinel yet. What about cybersecurity risks surrounding AI? What can organizations do to mitigate that risk? Yeah, there's a two fronts in that. One is the cybersecurity of AI systems because AI systems are trained on data. There are many new ways of attacking an AI system. You can poison the training data. You can generate some counter examples to fool an AI system to make the wrong decision. So that's one element which is very important. Organizations need to understand the risk to, to be careful about the model they put out in, in the wild and do monitoring. Another aspect of it is using AI for cybersecurity attack because AI can automate a lot of cybersecurity attacks. So we have seen an increased attack by AI driven systems. How do you counter? A human will not be uh, quick enough to counter a massive scale AI driven uh, attacks. You have to have AI fighting AI. So there's another element of how to leverage AI in protecting our critical infrastructure and other important services. James, what are your thoughts about cybersecurity risks surrounding AI and what organizations can do to mitigate it? Um, I think um, on one hand, you can probably say that if the biggest exposure an organization has is, is around an AI system, that they're probably doing quite, quite well. I think, you know, there's a lot more attacks that are are launched against businesses other than using kind of AI each day or the, the weaknesses or the, the, the risks are probably higher in other areas. But I think as any new kind of technology or uh, comes into the mainstream and becomes adopted at scale, it obviously does introduce new cybersecurity risks. But I think any organization that is aware of these risks and is constantly looking at how to mitigate them will be, will be fine. It's, uh, it's nothing hugely new in that sense. It's just continuing to be aware of the risk and, and taking proactive action. What do you think, Christina? Yeah, definitely. I think it's like any other IT system that you implement, um, cyber security should be the first thing that you think about. Um, you never go and implement a new system without considering that these days. So it should be one of the first things that you think about before you even implement an AI system. Um, so important these days. And, and as Leming said, um, AI systems are being used in hacking. So you have to make sure that you're protected from that instance so that those systems are protected. Uh, if it's not cyber security, what are some of the other risks uh, we're talking about when we look at AI? So I mentioned privacy risk. Mm -hmm. um, that's one that's um, obviously been in the news recently with the with a choice report that came out just last week um, where a number of retailers were using facial recognition technology. Now, there's a number of concerns with that. One was around um, privacy, obviously, and whether consent had actually been given. Um, by customers and consumers and, and whether that they were actually aware that that technology is in use. 
And then what's happening with that data? How is that yeah. da data being used um, at the back end? So yeah, privacy, I think, is a, a really hot topic when it comes to AI. Um, bias is obviously another really big one that, that, a, uh, that a lot of people get worried about when it comes to AI. Obviously, algorithms require huge amounts of training data sets, and that training data set comes from human society that carries a lot of bias. Um, so we always have to be thinking about how bias is going to play out when we use it to train an algorithm because that can often be very hard to unpick once that is, uh, is established. You talked about privacy. Would you be concerned if you were one of those people walking into a store and they were sort of tracking all your details without you knowing? Yeah, definitely, I would be, because uh, you don't know how that data's been used. Mm. Um, and I think that it, it's, it's quite commonplace now that we can go into a, a, a retail shop and not know that this, this technology is being used upon us. Um, so, you know, some stores are actually putting um, notices out the front, but sometimes they're very small. Um, and so the question is, well, is that true consent? And how is that consent playing out, um, you know, in, in real kind of virtual, uh, in, in, you know, bricks and mortar stores, but also in the virtual space? Um, so I think we're going to see more attention paid to, to the privacy and consent space when it comes to AI. Yes, because you can't really see it going backwards, can you? I mean, this is happening, it's happening more and more. And I, I feel like as a consumer, yes, there are a lot of worrying things about privacy. Let's go back to you, James. How about um, AI in terms of increasing productivity? Is it going to replace humans? I mean, I think um, AI works best when it works with humans rather, rather than when it replaces humans. I think that the real promise of AI, and I touched on automation earlier, and it's a common theme in this conversation, but um, the ability to use this technology to reduce some of the manual effort that's involved in a lot of business processes and free people up to focus on higher value work. I think that's the real promise of it. When Typically, when we see projects at times, you know, just replace a human being um, versus make their life a bit easier or augment them, um, we, you know, th these projects, I think, are a higher likelihood of failure. So I think humans and AI together is, is really the direction we want to we want to pursue. Lyman, what do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely agree. And, and people are already saying AI shouldn't be standing just for artificial intelligence, but augmented intelligence. So AI is helping human to augment intelligence and perform tasks better. But uh, there's a lot of talks about putting AI in the, uh, putting human in the loop of AI because people are afraid of AI making decisions, the wrong decisions. But I think the important thing is to put, put a human meaningfully in the loop. Uh, human is not a liability sponge of absorbing some of the you know ai liability but uh, to, to be there to be meaningfully engaged with ai to make the best decisions collectively let me in your view me, what's the most exciting thing we can look forward to with ai well it's uh, again as you know that's depending on whether you look at the business and the consumers uh, for consumers you will say really personalize the services, better services, including health and a lot of the education using AI. It's a revolution in those space. Uh, for business, uh, as other panelists already mentioned, productivity gain, launching new services, new products in adjacent markets. And the, the type of new service you may be saying uh, is very different. For example, you know, I'm a software engineering um, professional. These days I, I code, uh, write code with an AI co-pilot next to me, and they will make great suggestions and improve my credit, uh, you know, productivity. So that's just one of the small changes you experience. That's the positive things, James. What's the most worrying thing in your view that we'll have to keep an eye out? Is it privacy? Yeah, I, I think it is. I think it's responsible use of this technology. And um, we often hear the, the terminology um, fairness um, accountability and transparency when we talk about these systems. So is this system treating me or making a decision about me that's fair compared to other people's and it's not biased based on gender or, or ethnicity? Um, is there accountability? So if a decision is made about me, is there a recourse that I can take so I can contest things? And is there a level of transparency? So to the, to the previous point, do I know that I'm actually talking or dealing with a machine versus a human being? And I think if we get those things right, I think um, the future of AI globally and in Australia is, um, is, is incredibly promising. Christina, uh, where do you see our workplaces in, in five years? Are they going to be very different to today when it t in terms of AI? I definitely think so. I think what we'll see is that a lot of uh, the, the kind of boring, dull work that we see happening in, in many different sectors will be replaced and people doing jobs today will be augmented with technology. So I think it's a really exciting prospect for employees to learn new skills and to help them do their jobs better. 
Um, and I think every employee should be educating themselves and understanding how this technology serves to benefit them because it's a really exciting opportunity. It's exciting times, a fantastic conversation. Thank you, Christina, James and Living for your time today. It is much appreciated. Now let's hand it over to the CISO. I think there's a couple of things that are driving this. Firstly, the velocity and sophistication of attacks we're seeing are operating at levels never before seen. Uh, this is being driven by a few things. One, crime as a service, which enables these cyber criminals to be able to acquire and procure the resources, the technical skills and the tools that they need to successfully launch attacks. So it's reducing the barrier of entry uh, for cyber criminals. Then they're collaborating and sharing information more than ever before. I think there's also the element of you know, COVID and the hybrid working, working from home, remote working that we've seen over the past number of years or past couple of years where we've seen now our organisations are much more distributed, much more open than ever before. And this is creating more access points and, and attack, uh, attack points for cyber criminals to take advantage of. Obviously, there's also the, uh, the, the, the coverage, the media coverage of successful cyber attacks. If you think about cyber attacks and, and incidents, especially related to things such as ransomware and data breaches, we're seeing that more and more than ever before. So that is just heightening the focus and raising the level of awareness of this very important risk that organisations need to, to defend against. Now, there's a couple of things there, I think, that organisations should be thinking about as this becomes more prevalent and more of a discussion point for their organisation. One is thinking about building in operational resiliency into their organisation. Do they understand their business critical processes? Do they understand the systems that support those processes? And how are they thinking about protecting and making sure that those systems, processes and services are resilient so that they can continue to carry on their organisation? So, you know, my advice to CEOs and to executive teams is they should be asking their teams a number of questions. I'd be asking about do we know who has access to our critical systems? Do we know what those do we know what their vulnerabilities are and what we're doing about them? And are we doing them at pace? Are we doing them fast enough? How do we react constantly to changes of threats in the environment? Have we got a playbook that we've tested, evaluated, and uh, can execute in the event of a sex, uh, successful attack? And how do we manage cyber risks? from third parties, vendors, and critical service providers or critical, uh, critical partners? And how do we make sure that the impact of that is operationally sound for us? And that wraps up Crisis Control for this week. I'm Amber Sherlock. Thanks for watching. Crisis Control, brought to you by Zerilio. Cybersecurity experts protecting Australian businesses and organisations so we can all be safer together.